Good day to all of you. Welcome to the launch of the UN Nutrition Discussion Paper on the role of aquatic foods in a sustainable, healthy diet. My name is Tine Unema. I am the Executive Secretary of UN Nutrition, and we are hosting today's event in collaboration with World Fish. I will be your moderator. But before we dive into the exciting content of this webinar, just a few minutes to explain the house, housekeeping issues. If you now can hear me and see me speaking all right, no action is needed. If you are facing any trouble connecting on your computer, we suggest to close Zoom and join again. You can read the instructions in the chat box. If you con continue to encounter difficulties, please note we are recording the session and we'll make, we'll make available the recordings and the slides afterwards. This webinar will run until 3.30 Rome time, one hour and 30 minutes. Feel free to type any questions you may have in the Q&A box throughout. And at the end, the presenters will answer those by the end of this session. Now, without further ado, it's my huge pleasure to introduce our UN Nutrition first ever chair, Dr. Naoko Yamamoto, who is also Assistant Director General of WHO of the Universal Health Coverage and Healthier Population Division. She will share some opening remarks and set the stage for today's uh, discussion. Dr. Yamamoto, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Stenika san. Thank you very much. And distinguished panelists, ladies and gentlemen, and dear colleagues and friends, it's my pleasure to open this first UN Nutrition event. UN Nutrition is a coordination mechanism of UN agency for nutrition to ensure that nutrition efforts at global and country level are aligned, mutually supportive and well-coordinated. It is also enabled the UN to speak with one voice on nutrition. Today, we will launch the new UN Nutrition Discussion Paper on the role of aquatic foods in sustainable healthy diet. I'm joined by the authors of the paper and an esteemed panel experts from seven different organizations, including three UN agencies. This paper shows that aquatic food offer much potential for making sustainable healthy diet a reality throughout the world, even in low resource setting. Aquatic food provide many nutrients. They are variable, so source of protein, essential fatty acid, as well as many vitamins and minerals. This makes them important for key life stage like pregnancy and early childhood. From the environmental perspective, aquatic foods are key for building resilient food systems. And in some cases, like seaweed, they can improve marine biodiversity and water quality. This paper includes several experiences around the world about sustainable supply, nutrition, and the food safety of aquatic food. You will read our colleagues and in email the key findings from the paper. As a Japanese nation, uh, aquatic foods are my core of life. In this paper, there are key messages which are proven by long history and rich experience such as prioritization of use low trophic aquatic foods for direct human consumption or promoting of small scale fisheries, nutrition sensitive polyculture and system approach for aquatic food safety. We also will discuss innovation for using unutilized species or repurposing aquatic foods. The most important lesson we learned is that for healthy, sustainable aquatic foods, we need healthy forest, river, and land. Let me stop here and hand, would like to hand over Stenika san as uh, the Executive Secretary, Secretary of UN Nutrition. So uh, we're looking forward to have a good discussion about this issue. So now we'd like to hand over to Stenika san Over to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Naoko Yamamoto. And it's my huge pleasure, really my huge pleasure for me to moderate this extremely interesting first ever UN Nutrition webinar. I have to say, I have been moderating and participating in several events about this particular topic, aquatic foods, 
recognizing its huge potential. And now with this paper in hand, you can see the link to be able to download your own copy. Uh, now with this paper in hand, we have been able to gather all relevant available scientific evidence on this topic. And we can pre present this evidence as one piece of work. We have been collecting these data from several sectors and now it's all together in one piece of work. And this is timely as the preparations for the UN Food Systems Summit as well as the pre-summit um, are coming up to us this year in July and, uh, and later September. As Dr. Yamamoto mentioned, our speakers are from a range of institu institutions all over the world. So I thank all of you who have to stay up late and all of those who have to get up very early. As we are com I am personally comfortable in the middle of my day in, uh, in Europe. So we have World Fish, we have FAO, IFAB, World Food Programme, the Committee on World Food Security, we have NAPAD, and we have the Global Action Network on Sustainable Food from the Oceans and Inland, inland Waters for Food Security and Nutrition. So after a keynote address from World Fish um, Director, um, we will learn about the main takeaways of the new UN Nutrition Paper. Then we will invite some panelists to share their experiences related to the aquatic foods in their context and related to nutrition and, and One Health. And then we will also launch a dynamic Q&A session engaging you as an audience where we will field our questions and solic solicit your views. So let me quickly introduce our first speaker, the keynote address um, from Garrett Johnston, who is the Director General of World, World Fish and who is a specialist in integrated coastal ecosystem management and sustainable livestock and aquatic foods. I know, Garrett, you have been also working a lot cross-disciplinary and cross-sectorally and working a lot in partnerships and these value of partnerships was also showcased in the collaboration in this paper with your uh, with the contribution use contribution from uh, from your staff so without further ado let me um give provide the floor to to you and we are all listening and looking forward to your keynote uh, address Garrett, the floor is yours thank you standard care and thank you for those kind words and uh, and first i'd like to also thank dr Yama, uh, yamamoto for setting the scene <clears throat> for our discussion i'm really pleased to have the chance to speak at the launch of the un nutrition's first dis uh, discussion paper on the essential role of aquatic foods in sustainable healthy diets and as mentioned by Stenica, this is a really good paper. It brings all the different issues together. I encourage you to download it and, and uh, work through it. It brings together all the salient issues that UN member states need to know and consider in developing policies and investments to mainstream aquatic foods and healthy diets. Excuse me. Oh, it just dropped out. Okay, thank you. Yes, it's an excellent report. Mainstreams, uh, the ability to mainstream aquatic foods and healthy diets and, and, the, and meeting sustainable development goals. And it's really timely. Uh, as the discussion paper suggests, now is the time to seize this very much a game-changing solutions that aquatic foods offer for transforming food systems to nourish all people and our planet. Diverse aquatic foods from inland waters and from oceans are an integral part of local diets, of cultures and food production. They provide over 3 billion people with at least 20% of their animal protein. And it's more than just protein. These aquatic foods provide critical micronutrients, vitamins, minerals, omega fatty acids that are essential for well-nourished populations. As we know, this is essential uh, important for the cognitive development of children in the first thousand days and also to a second important period the next seven thousand days critical to development in adolescence and, and particularly girls and demand for aquatic foods has never been higher and continues to grow especially in low and middle income countries in fact fish consumption is rising at a yearly growth rate that is outpacing both world population expansion 
and the rise in meat consumption. Despite this growth, aquatic foods are still underrepresented in food and nutrition agendas. I, I believe we've gone beyond the and fish stage and an addition to, to an afterthought, but we are still, there are still some ways to go to mainstreaming aquatic foods in our policy agenda and investment agendas. As a result, those who are poised to benefit most from the nutritional benefits of aquatic foods continue to miss out. The latest UNICEF, WHO, World Bank estimates show that child malnutrition is still a growing issue. We are not on track to reach the goal to nourish all people by 2030. As the authors of the paper will point out today, diverse aquatic foods offer a life-changing potential for the more than 2 billion children, women and men suffering from malnutrition. Now, as a Director General of World Fish, I've seen at first hand the multiple benefits that aquatic foods are providing to the world's most vulnerable. I've seen how a spoonful of dried fish powder mixed into a child's porridge in Malawi, daily basis has lifelong benefits for growth and development. How fish chutney added to daily meals improves the health of pregnant women and mothers in Bangladesh. I've seen how the state of addition India has revolutionized the fight on uh, malnutrition by incorporating aquatic foods into feeding programs to nourish children, women and adolescent girls. And I've seen how sustainable, inclusive aquatic food systems produce more diverse, nutritious foods at lower environmental costs than many terrestrial land-based production systems, all the while employing many of the world's most vulnerable, half of whom are women. Now, with the impacts of COVID, which we all experience, it's pushing more people into poverty and increasing the number of malnourished people. And there has not been a more important time to step up efforts to ensure that aquatic foods get to those who need them most. In order to harvest their full potential, aquatic food systems must be integrated across food and nutrition agendas at national and global levels. And this is why reports like the UN Nutrition Discussion Paper are so important as we continue to inform and shape the narrative on sustainable, healthy diets. This year is particularly important as we have a unique opportunity to ensure aquatic foods are central to a food system's transformation for healthy people and planet. We're doing this by ensuring that aquatic foods are integrated across the discussions and commitment as part of the UN Food System Summit and COP26. The UN Food System Summit is all about changing mindsets, shifting the discourse and coordinating actions among different actors to transform how we produce, consume and think about food. Now, in my view, there can be no food systems transformation without aquatic foods and the people who depend on them for food and nutrition, livelihoods and well-being. So with this renewed focus on food systems approaches that are inter interdisciplinary and holistic, we have the opportunity to rethink the future of food, where it comes from, how it's produced, distributed and consumed, who benefits from it and how it impacts our environment. And to do this, our solutions must link food, land and water production systems and examine the opportunities, options and trade-offs between these different systems. We do see these shifts spearheaded by the agencies like the UN, UN Nutrition in this latest report, and I congratulate them for this important step. We see this happening in the CGIR, the world's largest agricultural research and innovation network that are responding collectively to transform food, land and water systems and to end hunger and achieve the sustainable development goals by 2030. This is what makes today's discussion so important. Together, we must build global movement where researchers, funders, policymakers, business leaders, along with local producers, traders and consumers create shared value and co-design interventions that make aquatic foods an integral part of the food systems transformation agenda. Now, last year, so we may be aware that Wellfish launched our 2030 research and innovation strategy. Again, I encourage you to go to the website and download that. It's called Aquatic Foods for Healthy People and Planet. And with this new report, it can help us all to accomplish three key goals here. First, to raise awareness of the critical nutritional benefits of safe aquatic foods and ensure that they are key to nutrition and public health solutions. Secondly, to ensure aquatic foods are affordable and accessible so that we can maximize social and economic impacts for inclusive growth. 
Thirdly, to ensure the sustainable production of diverse aquatic foods so that we minimize the impact on the environment and increase our resilience to climate risks and change. So with this in mind, I'd like to hand back to our moderator. It'd be great to hear from the authors and esteemed panelists on how the discussion paper can contribute to efforts that ensure aquatic foods are mainstreamed in achieving healthy, sustainable diets for all. Thank you, and over to you, Stenica. Thanks. Thank you, Garrett. I, I really listened attentively to your speech, to your introductory words, and apart from your key messages, the way you, how you simply stated the clear, the clear examples of relatively simple additions to children's meals can make such a huge and lifelong difference. But then segueing straight into the key steps that we are needed, that are needed right now in order to scale up these relatively simple solutions that are at our hands as we speak. So let's go on, let's move on. And let's move on to your colleague, Shakuntala Tilstedt, who is one of the main author of the paper, and also uh, Molly Ahern, who will be jointly presenting the findings of, uh, of this uh, UN nutrition discussion paper. So Shakuntala, she is the global lead of nutrition and public health at World Fish. And Shakuntala and I, we have known each other for quite some time. Um, Shakuntala always emphasizing not just the protein qualities of, of, of fishes, but also the micronutrient qualities. And having worked quite a long time on nutrition sensitive fisheries and aquaculture. Um, Shakuntala is also the vice chair of the Advancing Equitable Livestock Action Track in the 2021 Food Systems Summit. Molly Ahern, she also is a food security and nutrition specialist, but worked with the FAO, FAO Fisheries Division in Rome. Like Shakuntala, she's worked a lot on nutrition sensitive um, value change for fish. And um, she's supported also quite some nutrition education programs, um, basically in, in Southern Africa. Uh, Molly, I believe you are the first one starting off, kicking off the presentation of the joint uh, UN Nutrition Discussion paper. The floor is yours. Thank you, Stinica, and I just want to say I'm honored to follow such esteemed speakers and present this discussion paper alongside Shakuntala. On the next slide, um, I'll give the background. Uh, uh, this is the, the outline of the presentation. I'll give the background, define key terms, introduce the objective of the discussion paper, and then go into why aquatic foods are essential in sustainable healthy diets and look at the current evidence of them in healthy diets. Then I'll turn this over to Shakuntala to go over the recommendations. Next slide. In 2017, the UN Standing Committee on Nutrition, or UNSCN, which is now UN Nutrition, published a global narrative on nutrition, contributing to the beginning of the UN Decade of Action on Nutrition, ending in 2025, and described the nutrition landscape, building on a comprehensive set of international targets and goals, including the World Health Assembly, Global Nutrition, and Non-Communicable Disease Targets, the 2030 Agenda, and the commitment and framework for action of the ICN2. The Global Action Network on Sustainable Food from the Oceans and Inland Waters for Food Security and Nutrition was formed under the umbrella of the UN Decade of Action in response to the advice of the CFS High-Level Panel of Experts report from 2014 to promote recognition of aquatic foods for food security and nutrition. Last year's report on the state of food insecurity stated that current food systems produce enough food, but the cost of a healthy diet remains unaffordable to many, with expected increases in those experiencing food insecurity and malnutrition due to COVID-19. This highlights the need to promote diets that are socially, economically, and environmentally sustainable. However, despite this recognition that fish is an essential part of healthy diets, present food systems fail to recognize the diversity of aquatic foods and their potential to, co to contribute to sustainable healthy diets, not only as protein, as Gareth mentioned, but for essential micronutrients and fatty acids. Next slide. First, I'll define a couple of key terms that we use throughout the presentation and throughout the discussion paper. Despite growing recognition of the importance of sustainable healthy diets, efforts to promote them have lacked a robust and well-defined narrative. To this end, in 2019, the Eat Lancet Commission published planetary health guidelines, 
While the FAO and WHO published a set of principles for sustainable healthy diets in an attempt to define this narrative. The discussion paper includes the full definition of sustainable healthy diets from the FAO and WHO guidelines. However, here I'll highlight that sustainable healthy diets promote all dimensions of health and well being, have low environmental pressure and impact, and are accessible, affordable, safe, equitable, and culturally acceptable. However, debate over the role of animal source foods in sustainable healthy diets continues. Aquatic foods are often simplified to only think of fin fish and lumped in with animal source foods, including terrestrial animal source foods, but there is much greater diversity and potential within aquatic foods. Next slide. A key term that we have repeated here many times already today is aquatic foods, but what do we mean by this? Traditionally, when people think of food from aquatic environments, they may think of seafood or fish. However, aquatic foods encompass a much broader range of foods, including animals, plants, and microorganisms that are farmed in and harvested from water, as well as cell and plant-based foods emerging from new technologies. Next slide. The discussion paper aims to build consensus on the role of aquatic foods in sustainable healthy diets, presenting the breadth of evidence available to inform and steer policy investments and research to make full use of the vast potential of aquatic foods in delivering sustainable healthy diets and meeting the SDGs. Next slide. So why aquatic foods? Aquatic foods are diverse, each with unique qualities and nutrients such as iron, zinc, calcium, iodine, vitamins A, B12 and D, and omega-3 fatty acids which are important for physical and cognitive development. In addition, the micronutrients in aquatic animals are highly bioavailable and enhance the absorption of micronutrients such as iron and zinc from plant sourced foods when consumed together. Next slide, please. Aquatic foods are not only important for improved public health nutrition outcomes in the first 1000 days, as we've heard from conception to the child's second birthday, but throughout life. Here we have a simple depiction of a life cycle. I'll start at the top where we see pregnant and lactating women for whom consumption of aquatic foods has been evidenced for contributing to greater dietary diversity, as well as positive birth outcomes and improved nutrient composition of breast milk, which is particularly important in infant and young child feeding. If we move to infants and young children, there's evidence that those who directly consume aquatic foods from six months of age onwards have greater cognitive development and reduced prevalence of stunting and severe acute malnutrition. Despite much focus on the first 1,000 days, there's evidence that physical and cognitive growth extends for an additional 7,000 days through adolescence. Consumption of aquatic foods during adolescence contributes to cognitive development, higher IQ, improved school performance, and positive behavioral and mental health outcomes. These positive outcomes extend into adulthood with evidence of higher IQ and improved work performance, as well as consumption of aquatic foods being linked to reduced risk of chronic diseases, as well as reduced all-cause mortality, reduced blood pressure, and cholesterol. In addition, aquatic foods are nutrient-rich while also contributing to reduced energy intake, leading to weight loss and when consumed as, when consumed as an alternative to meat. Next slide. Beyond being a sustainable source of nutrients for diets, there's evidence of sustainability of aquatic foods across the three pillars of sustainability. Economically speaking, for many poor rural populations, fish and particularly small fish may be the most accessible, affordable, or preferred animal source food. This is particularly important as we saw in the background slides that the cost of a healthy diet is unaffordable to millions of people and expected to be exacerbated by COVID-19. Environmentally, consuming aquatic foods presents an opportunity for greater sustainability as the production of aquatic animal source foods has a lower environmental impact than the production of most terrestrial animal source foods. Socially, many rural poor are engaged in small scale fishing and aquaculture activities with about 50% of those involved in the primary and secondary sector sectors being women. Next slide. Now that we have seen why aquatic foods are essential, we will look at how they are currently represented, promoted and supplied. The Guiding Principles for Sustainable Healthy Diets, Principle 4, promotes moderate consumption of aquatic foods, but moderate is undefined. Traditionally, dietary recommendations for the consumption of aquatic foods focused on balancing nutritional benefits with food safety concerns over bioaccumulation of contaminants and pollutants. 
More recent recommendations have adopted a more holistic approach, taking into account concerns over the environmental impact on food production. However, this recommended reference diet, referring to the Eat Lancet diet, has been criticized as failing to recognize cultural and individual dietary choices, as well as for its unaffordability, particularly in many low and middle income countries. Thus, the need for national food-based dietary guidelines to be contextualized and adapted to cultural preferences. The discussion paper provides a summary of a review of 94 food-based dietary guidelines, 78 of which had varying recommendations for aquatic foods. Next slide. Here I'll present two, briefly present two case studies uh, that we included in the discussion paper on nutrition interventions, which included aquatic foods in the first 1,000 days and in school feeding programs. In Malawi and Zambia, small fish are often the only animal source food, but availability varies seasonally due to rains and fishing regulations. We worked with local communities to dry small fish during peak production and process them into fish powders, which were then integrated into local recipes with high acceptance based on sensory evaluations conducted with women and young children. Issues such as food safety, food loss, and women's time use in grinding powders were addressed through improved technologies, which also extended the shelf life of the fish powder. In Ghana, factory remnants of tuna frames as well as three underutilized small fish species were dried and ground into fish powder, then added to four local dishes and served in school meals. Students assessed these meals, finding them highly acceptable. Later, proximate and nutrient analysis were completed, showing high content of iron and protein in these powders, offering a low-cost solution for improving nutritional value of traditional school meals, while also reducing food loss and waste and encouraging sustainable healthy diets. To this end, the discussion paper details a couple of considerations for the sustainability, sustainable supply of aquatic foods, starting with the reduction of food loss and waste. A reduction in aquatic food loss and waste can make more food available without putting more pressure on the environment. However, food loss in aquatic food value chains is high in low and middle income countries due to poor handling, processing, storage, and marketing practices, which are further exacerbated by seasonal heavy rains that often coincide with peak production periods. Further, sociocultural, sociocultural and gender norms may limit the access of women who often work in fisheries post-harvest to, harvest, to resources, technology, and assets that can improve efficiencies and reduce food loss and waste. Next slide. Looking at sustainable supply from capture fisheries, 88% of global capture fisheries production was from marine waters, with the remainder from inland waters. However, there is evidence that inland catch is underrepresented in these figures. Capture fisheries differ in scale, equipment, capacity, and methods with varying impact from fuel consumption, greenhouse gas emissions, biodiversity, and aquatic community structures. Small-scale fisheries in particular offer livelihood activities to coastal communities, as well as food and nutrition security. For example, 95% of inland catch is consumed locally. However, this contribution is often under-recognized in fiscal instruments and policies, and there's need for recognition of the interconnected socioeconomic and nutritional impacts of high seas governance and ocean property rights in relation to industrial fishing, as well as Mari culture and non-fishing activities. Next slide. Aquaculture is a rapidly expanding source of aquatic foods with production reaching an all-time high in 2018. Similar to capture fisheries, environmental impacts of aquaculture vary depending on method, species, scale, practices, facilities, and integration with other food producing activities. Global, glo gro global growth in aquaculture has provided some benefits to the environment by alleviating pressure on wild stocks, replenishing depleted stocks, and providing ecosystem services such as bioremediation, waste removal, and habitat structure. However, if aquaculture is to be sustainable, a sustainable source of food supply and improve food security and nutrition, we must tackle challenges associated with feed ingredients, the diversity of species produced, land and water usage, and equitable distribution. I'll now turn it over to Shakuntala to briefly summarize the recommendations. Thank you so much, Molly. And first, let me thank you and Stinica for going on this journey with me and getting this paper finished in time for this launch. There were many days and nights where we thought we wouldn't get there, but now we are here. Thank you both. 
So what I want to do is promote, what I want to do is to present the menu of solutions for aquatic foods consumption. And firstly, I'd like to talk about promoting consumer behavior and demand for more sustainable, diverse and low tropic aquatic foods. And with this, look at food-based dietary guidelines, public procurement, such as school feeding and social safety nets, nutrition interventions in the first thousand days of life, as all the speakers before me have talked about, and innovative, affordable, and convenient aquatic foods products for and byproducts. And now, especially with the responses of to the ravages of COVID-19. It is extremely important that we take into consideration, for example, public procurement. There are many organizations and many U UN organizations and also um, non-governmental organizations that are calling for greater efforts to ramp up school feeding and social, and social safety nets. And in doing so, we must have consideration for the poor and vulnerable. Next slide, please. So the next um, on our menu of solutions for aquatic food consumption, I'd like to talk about sustainable supplies. And as we know that the, the sustainable supplies can come from many sources. But having a sustainable supply of aquatic foods, it must also build on resilient aquatic food systems. And in so doing, we must also, Molly has talked about, target diverse aquatic foods in the supply systems. We must focus on sustainable harvest, harvesting and catch use. For example, encourage consumers to choose the catch of the day or bycatch in, in preparing their meats and promote sustainable and diversified aquaculture. An extremely important component of sustainable supply is reducing loss and waste of aquatic foods. In doing so, I would like to draw attention on the adoption and the implementation of voluntary guidelines for securing sustainable small-scale fisheries and the CFS recommendations on fisheries and aquaculture. Since we wrote this discussion paper, CFS has released the CFS Voluntary Guidelines on Food Systems and Nutrition, which calls for diverse nutritious foods, including aquatic foods, for sustainable healthy diets. Next slide, please. In our menu of solutions, the next I want to talk about is democratization of the knowledge, data, and technologies. And firstly, the need to improve the quality of data, as uh, the quality of data, and as Molly mentioned, in captive fisheries, we, we know that there is an underestimation of the of the of, of the amount of aquatic foods that's harvested from captive fisheries. Also in aquaculture, especially small-scale aquaculture, we do need better better quality data. And we have to move move not only quality data in terms of production, processing and distribution, but gather data for a better understanding of consumption practices across different countries, communities and households. Without having that data, then it's extremely difficult to make use of the solutions we have at hand. We also have to build data on nutritional composition and, com and contaminants for a broad range of aquatic foods. I've worked for many years on looking at the data on nutritional composition of aquatic foods and have just made a dent of the, of the many diverse foods that we have to have better data on. And lastly, I do think that we need to engage much better with private sector to develop desirable and convenient products to promote nutritious aquatic foods, especially in the first 1000 days of life. Next slide, please. In conclusion, let me say that diverse aquatic foods have an essential role in sustainable, healthy diets for many people around the world now and in the future. And with this menu of solutions, which we have presented, we can shape the recommendations of the UN Food Systems Summit 2021, the Decade of Action on Nutrition, and the Decade on Ocean Science, as well as 
country actions and thereby contribute to achieving the SDGs and in particular SDG2. Next slide, please. With this, I'd like to acknowledge the very large numbers of individuals on organiz and organizations that Stinica, Molly, and I have called upon as we were writing this paper. They've, they've all contributed a lot and sharing their ideas and also reviewing the paper with us. And therefore, we do hope that this paper would be widely accepted by UN organizations, by the many partners that have worked with us, and by governments, so that we can use aquatic foods for healthy people, healthy planet. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Shakuntala. Thank you so much, uh, Molly, for this very, very clear presentation of this very very interesting and important uh, discussion paper about aquatic foods and their role in sustainable healthy diets. Let me just highlight again, I, I know you've said it over and over, just highlight again the vast diversity of aquatic foods that offers the win-win solution for both human and planetary health. You, both of you, did so well summarizing those key points related to that win-win. That but in addition to that win-win for human and planetary health, also important to highlight over and over again the important role of these foods uh, for improving the dietary quality, specifically of the poorer segments of the population. Healthy diets, as was stated, are very often out of reach for many, many people. However, aquatic foods multiply the affordable options that we are all having. Um, I know that the audience, in the meantime, has been typing some questions in the Q&A box, so please continue doing that. By the end of the session, we will try to address um, as many as possible of, of those questions. Um, now, we have... Uh, uh, listen to the main messages and outputs of that UN nutrition discussion paper. I'd like to introduce, uh, turn to our, our panelists, who will all speak from their experiences, from their contexts, and putting the paper uh, in, in, in their, in their relative, relative um, respective working areas. Um, so first of all, I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Tanabat Tiensim, the current chair of the UN Committee on World Food Security. Um, he is also permanent representative of Thailand to the UN agencies in, uh, in Rome. And of course, he has served in various commissions, councils and, and committees. Uh, his work covered so many technical areas from agriculture to livestock, food security, food safety, international trade, etc., etc. I also would like to highlight that the predecessor of UN Nutrition, the UNSCN, worked uh, together with the Committee on World Food Security several times, exploring options, but also in the context of aquatic foods, tabling the issues and building the momentum for, in fact, this moment, the launch of this uh, discussion paper. Um, uh, Tanavat, I... I'm sure you listened carefully to Shakuntala when she also referred to the work of the CFS, both the earlier documents you did on uh, as CFS, you did on, uh, on sustainable fisheries, but also more recently, the um, finalization of the voluntary guidelines on food systems and nutrition. Um, and Dr. Tanawat, would you like to look a little bit at the commonalities of, of this report's findings as well and the voluntary guidelines on food systems and nutrition? What actions can be taken at the country level for the local production and consumption of aquatic foods in low and middle income countries? Tanawat, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Arsenica, for your introduction. And also, I'm very delighted uh, to join you here today and speak about the role of aquatic food uh, in sustainable uh, healthy diets, which is, is a topic is close to me. And also why it's close to me? Because my, as you know that I'm from Thailand, which is actually my hometown, it's just about two or three kilometers away from the fishing village in the south of Thailand, which actually we can see how important of the aquatic food 
uh, for the local people in that area, which actually is my house is also, it's not far from the rivers. It's just only one kilometers. That when I go to the rivers, I can see the activities of uh, fresh water aquacultures of a small scale uh, farmers that they have uh, floating fish cages along the rivers, which actually we can see that how the uh, aquatic uh, food play an important role for the local people uh, uh, and also in Thailand, especially as you know that uh, uh, fish and also seafood is our one of the main dish in Thai cuisine, as some of you may know. And also uh, in our uh, the school lunch program, I think uh, we can see uh, fried fish or fish and seaweed soups are served as the uh, two school uh, students uh, for the school lunch program, which actually is a common practice because we know the values, we know the nutritious of uh, aquatic food that can uh, support uh, the nutrition of uh, our children. And that's why, as some of you have heard several times, that fish is the primary source of the animal protein uh, for ourselves and also particular uh, for those who are living uh, in coastal areas and also along the rivers. And that's also today I would like to congratulate uh, to the UN Nutrition, World Fish and also other partners for organizing these events and for the excellent paper that you have made. Uh, this put uh, a spotlight on fish and also aqua uh, aquatic uh, food uh, and their roles uh, in achieving sustainable uh, and healthy diets. This is crucial as we uh, seek the way of uh, addressing ex uh, the global hunger and malnutrition. It is also um, is a key that uh, the issues are uh, as you mentioned about the UN Food System Summit, and that's why the aquatic food will play an important role uh, where we will agree on the action to accelerate uh, progress toward the 2030 agenda and also SDG. As you mentioned about the work of the CFS and also some of the CFS products, we know that the work of the UN Nutrition that you are doing align very well with our work at the Committee uh, on World Food Security CFS, which I'm chairing at the moment. Uh, for us, um, I'm very glad uh, to hear several times about the uh, CFS uh, policy products that you reference uh, to your work. And also uh, you mentioned about the CFS high level panel of expert and it products, which actually, as uh, you know that just recently in February, uh, the voluntary guideline on food system and nutrition uh, just was endo uh, endorsed uh, during uh, the CFS 47 plenary, which actually this voluntary guideline also is one of the key um, um, guidelines that we support uh, the work and also the discussion of the UN Food System Summit. And also you mentioned about the other two papers of the CFS one is about the sustainable, um, sustainable fisheries and aquaculture for food securities and nutrition, as you have seen this one, and also the food securities, uh, the global narrative, which just was launched last year. And the two, uh, all the CFS uh, policy products, especially the CFS voluntary guideline on food system and nutrition, promote uh, policies and action that enhance the livelihoods health and also well-being of population, in particular the vulnerable and marginalized uh, people. The CFS guideline also underlies the importance of aquatic ecosystem, fisheries and aquaculture for healthy diets and nutrition. It is just like the new UN nutrition report being launched today. I think we really work together to make sure that we complement each other to improve uh, the nutrition for all. Uh, to continue enjoying the health uh, benefit of fish and other aquatic food, Thailand and also the rest of the world must, must fully acknowledge uh, the strong uh, interlinkage between sustainable food system, healthy diets, 
to the role of aquatic food, especially at the country level in terms of the poly, uh, procurement policies of the governments and also with other key actors. We need to ensure that those policies, uh, procurement policy, public procurement policy through the school feeding program and other program implemented by the government, it really pay attention of the important role of aquatic food. Um, and we also need to encourage uh, the innovative partnerships and approaches that support governments uh, in this effort. This new report by the UN Nutrition is one of the such approaches. And I would like uh, to acknowledge our ongoing partnership between CFS and FAO Fishery to highlight synergies and complementarities between the voluntary guideline on food system and new and the voluntary guideline for uh, securing sustainable uh, small-scale fisheries. For Thailand, for the uh, Committee on World Food Security, CFS, and for all of us here and also around the world, achieving food securities and ending uh, malnutrition is our common goals and also is a common uh, global priorities as indicated by the SDG2 on zero hungers and our food system must be transformed uh, to become nutri uh, nutrition sensi uh, sensitive and sustainable. And so that everyone is granted access to safe, diverse and high quality diets at all time. And as we have heard before, the aquatic food is a global place to start. I encourage all of you uh, to utilize this UN nutrition report, as well as the CFS voluntary guideline on food system and nutrition in your work, at your home country, at your office, at your place in the field. Uh, and now all the uh, report, all the guidelines are available. And also this work is your works. And now we need your action if we want to see uh, the result for healthy people and healthy diet. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tanavat, for highlighting these uh, these opportunities, these commonalities between this report and the work the CFS is doing. I'm sure all people online, as well as the several actors, will continue to support member states in uptaking um, this, the, the relevant and all uh, CFS uh, gui voluntary guidelines. I particularly also liked uh, what you mentioned about the public procurement policies and those in the context of, for example, school feeding programs and the opportunities that those tools, in fact, have to, to integrate uh, aquatic foods in uh, in these, uh, these policies and, and tools. So thank you so much for, for highlighting those as well. So let's move on and let's move on to our next speaker. Before I say that, that I, I, I just want like to, to thank you again, Tanabat. I'm aware that you need to leave earlier today. So in case there's any questions particularly directed at you, you will, we will find a way to, uh, to answer those, uh, uh, maybe not live in this seminar, but, but afterwards. So the next speaker we have uh, today is Kefilwe Roba Moalusi, who is a senior nutrition and food safety specialist uh, and who is now acting as the head of nutrition unit of the African Union Development Agency. Um, among others, she also provides technical support to the Food Systems Summit Dialogues for African Union member states and regional economic communities. I know we have been referring several times to the Food Systems Summit right now, and I think there's also some questions coming up around it. So looking forward to, uh, to speaking more about that. Um, but back to you, Kefilwe. As representative of NEPAD, how can the report's recommendations inform policies and investments needed to boost sustainable local supply and consumption of aquatic foods? Kefilwe, I'm looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Stenek. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for the opportunity, opportunity again. And uh, good evening, good afternoon to all of you here present. 
My name is Kifilwe Malusi, as uh, Senek had mentioned. I work for the African U Union Development Agency, newly as NEPAD. For those who don't know, AUD and NEPAD is the technical implementing arm of the African Union. As you rightfully mentioned, we work with the policies and programs for the AU member states. Uh, as NEPAD, we actually started, uh, you know, introducing the Fisheries and Agriculture Program back in 2009 under the umbrella of CADAP. So CADAP is what is known as the Comprehensive Africa Agriculture Program Development. And this was supported by the grant from the UK government, you know, under the International Partnership for Africa's Fisheries Governance and Trade. So since then, we have been doing a lot of, um, you know, fish and agriculture. We have developed uh, nutrition sensitive interventions under CADAP framework. And this also started in 2011, whereby we tried to infuse the importance of uh, nutrition intervention within agriculture. And of course, uh, advocating for investment in, in fisheries and agriculture. As, as many of you have mentioned here, we know the importance of uh, fish consumption. We have also developed what is called the blue economy. So the blue economy strategy, which was formed in 2019, is part of the Africa's, African Union's 2050 Africa's Integrated Maritime Strategy. This is also part of the African Union, Union um, Agenda 2023, which is the Africa that we want. We work with uh, original economic communities uh, in Africa, eight of them, to push for this blue economy investment, because we believe that with the blue economy uh, uh, in the picture, governments will have a huge opportunity to create new sources of revenue that may contribute to the implementation of other national development plans and also boosting the economy. More so that we have uh, a lot of um, uh, you know, uh, issues on the food system because of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Other than that, we also work with uh, home, through home -grown school feeding uh, program, whereby we strengthen you know, the policies on nutrition sensitive. For example, we have been training uh, many AU member states in what is called school meal planner tool. Now school meal planner tool was implemented in Nigeria whereby we work with uh, uh, women who supplies the school in fish and therefore adding value to fish and also improving the quality and the diet of the, of the school, uh, school meals. We also infuse the element of food safety because food safety is very, very important along the value chain. We want to ensure that our children do consume the food that is, uh, is safe uh, at all times. We have also been uh, working, for example, uh, through the IFNA, what is called Initiative for Food and Nutrition Security in Africa. It's an initiative that was launched by JICA and NEPAD in 2016, whereby we also try to do what is called improved uh, nutrition approach by also infusing the element of uh, fisheries and aquaculture into the whole um, um, initiative implementation. Uh, we also, through the Malawi Declaration, we have been doing what is called policy framework and reform strategy for fisheries and agriculture in Africa. This was also, be, was also adopted by the African Union member states and the government. So we ensure that every two years, for example, under the Malabo um, Declaration reporting, member states do report on issues of fisheries and agriculture. We do have examples of uh, what Africa is actually prioritized when it comes to fish. Some of the speakers have mentioned experience in Zambia and Malawi. We know that uh, with the uh, climate changes condition, this affect the small fishes that are available. For example, in the diets of uh, local diet of Zambia and Malawians, they do consume carpenter and usipa in the local language. Those are small fish that you know that are also re a resource of protein, like you mentioned, also resource of micronutrients going forward. So we as, uh, as AU NEPAT, we want to improve the policies of fish and agriculture in Africa by also developing what is called um, fish governance and trade. The fish governance and trade is a program that also uh, helps to strengthen the fish policies and also including the, the food safety standards of the fish and therefore boosting uh, the trade amongst African uh, Union member states and of course to the world. And this also will help in uh, accelerating the implementation of what is called the African Continental Free Trade Area. The free trade area, which was also uh, it started commencing or started functioning the 1st of January this year. So that's how we influence the policies in, in, in Africa. This is uh, information is available online on NEPAD 
and we do work with uh, Rex and the member states in terms of uh, reinforcing policies on fisheries and agriculture uh, in Africa. Over to Stanek and thank you for the opportunity again. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gafijiba. I really liked, appreciated how you were able to link uh, many of the findings of the paper to the context you are working in uh, in Nepal. Uh, particularly, I was uh, intrigued by how you were able to bring in the aspect of governance and trade in, in fish and fish products. That's extremely important if you want to work towards those three main outcomes planetary and human health, as well as, as um, access of all to a sustainable, healthy diet. So thank you so much for that. Um, let's continue with our next speaker on the panel, uh, Richard Abila from IFAD, the International Fund for Agriculture, uh, Agriculture Development. Uh, Richard is a senior global technical specialist for fisheries and aquaculture. And we are very happy to have him um, to listen to his exp uh, expert and experience in small scale fisheries and aquaculture, including freshwater and coastal marine systems. Richard, I would also like to thank you personally because you have been able to provide us with very valuable comments and insights when we were developing and working on this um, uh, discussion paper. Um, Richard, over to you. Please feel free to share a bit more about yourself and maybe even wake up participants. We are most, more or less halfway the webinar, so maybe we need a laugh or a stretch. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Nick. Of course, I mean, uh, one thing about uh, technology uh, like this is, um, uh, you know, as panelists, we, we see ourselves that we assume, you know, everyone is, uh, is, 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 is seeing us, but we don't see them. Uh, we, we recognize that uh, uh, some places, uh, maybe people are waking up, uh, some places, possibly some uh, you know, people are looking at their clocks when the seminar is going to end so that they can get to bed. Uh, so just uh, to keep ourselves alert, maybe we take 10 seconds, uh, so we can uh, stand up, uh, stretch, and uh, then we can continue after that. So 10 seconds, please. Uh, our 217 participants uh, to keep ourselves alert. Starting with me. <laughs> yes. Okay. I think we can continue now. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, as an institution working across uh, different um, food sectors, um, IFAD probably is um, uh, in an advantage position to look at um, uh, nutrition in quite uh, comprehensively. Uh, we work, of course, in agriculture, in livestock, um, and of course now in, in fisheries. Um, we see aquatic food in that light that um, it really helps us in um, contributing to this aspect of dietary diversity and looking especially at um, the target groups that IFAD um, is focused on, the poor, the rural, uh, rural populations um, in small islands, uh, in coastal areas. Some of these areas that are not reached uh, by other IFAD interventions, in, especially in agriculture and in livestock. So it helps us to uh, have a more comprehensive um, um, attention in terms of meeting their food and nutritional needs. Um, over the past uh, decades, close to uh, between five and 8% of um, IFAD programs of loans and grants on an annual basis have gone to supporting aquatic food sector. Uh, currently, we have about 35 projects across uh, different regions. Now, this might look small when we talk about 5 to 8 percent, but it's quite, uh, it's quite significant. And of course, noting that um, uh, traditionally, IFAD has been you know, an agricultural uh, dominated uh, organization. 
Uh, so increasingly, we see a lot of interest and a lot of commitment towards aquatic foods. Much of this interest especially is coming uh, uh, in sub-Saharan Africa and um, in Asian countries, uh, uh, Asian, Pacific, Caribbean countries. But again, also, you know, going to some of the areas that traditionally uh, IFA does not um, uh, been uh, involved in, especially in the aquatic uh, domain, uh, some parts of Latin America in, um, in Brazil, um, in Haiti now, we are big, talking about that. So there is uh, quite a bit of expansion. Now talking especially on the Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, this is one area which there is uh, extremely growing interest. In the last um, three or four years, um, just to give you an example, we have had large programs coming up. Kenya, Mozambique, Eritrea, Tanzania, Angola have, have uh, requested for IFAD support. Uh, a total of uh, close to 200 million in terms of the value of projects uh, have, uh, have been designed in those areas, uh, addressing specifically aquatic food sector. So that really shows uh, one, a growing interest. Secondly, um, I would say, you know, a lot of confidence in terms of um, that uh, the countries really are seeing the, these as uh, serious opportunities and, and they're really willing uh, to prioritize uh, these areas. Now, um, there are interesting lessons that we see, especially in terms of how IFAD approaches um, um, aquatic foods uh, and uh, I mean, in, in relation to nutrition. Now, the first one, uh, we note that um, we achieve better results. We achieve uh, better out nutrition outcomes when we use different pathways. So it's not just about uh, investing in production. Of course, production is, is, is important, uh, you know, ensuring that we produce more food, but there are also a lot of uh, you know, positive results in terms of, for example, um, working with communities to diversify incomes uh, using you know, different income pathways, empowerment of youth and women, um, looking at you know, healthy aquatic environments, you know, ensuring that um, uh, the, the, the investments are sustainable, and also uh, going through uh, um, you know, and, um, Nut I mean, uh, nutrition education, communication. So all these are avenues for enhancing, uh, uh, achieving uh, better nutritional uh, outcomes. Now, the second one is uh, in terms of how we approach our investment. Now, it's not just, uh, as I mentioned, just investing in, in, in at the production level, but looking at the entire aquatic food value chains. So, um, for example, the issue about reducing losses um, is one thing that has, um, uh, we give quite a bit of attention, uh, looking at it in terms of investing in um, loss reduction technologies, uh, infrastructure, for example, producing eyes and you know, ensuring that these are um, accessible to the smallholders. Uh, and also um, looking at um, uh, expanding the market space, uh, you know, using even digital technologies to ensure, you know, that um, first of all, on one side, that the, um, uh, the, the aquatic products are able to, you know, to uh, reach market, and also that they can actually be accessed by the the, uh, the relevant uh, poor uh, um, uh, communities. Now, uh, the third area is in terms of expanding the space for. Um, I mean, of where we uh, we work, both in terms of the resources uh, that we are um, uh, ready to uh, to support. So, for example, we have seen an increase in terms of diversity, uh, moving from the traditional um, uh, species um, uh, that we have uh, we we previously were involved with, but now expanding, for example, uh, in some countries uh, to things aquatic plants like seaweeds. And also increasingly showing a lot of interest in um, uh, the more affordable species, the small pelagics, for example, are areas that we are uh, getting more and more interested in. And then um, uh, quite, um, I would say, unique is um, looking at um, you know, an approach of integrating, not I mean, fisheries, aquaculture with other food systems. 
So uh, the aspect of integration is um, something that we are giving more and more attention across different countries. In fact, you'll find that many of the projects that, that we have now, not, they are not just fisheries projects, but fisheries uh, value chain with, mixed with um, livestock or crops value chain. And, and we see this as um, a very good approach. And lastly is the element of building partnerships. Now, this is something that I wanted uh, really to emphasize. Uh, there is a lot, uh, the, the field outside there is quite wide. I mean, you can ask, we can ask ourselves really, especially in the rural, the, the rural sectors, post harvest losses are still quite high. We are still talking of 30, 40% of, you know, food losses being incurred from the aquatic um, uh, Richard, so, sorry yeah. to interrupt you. Can you, can you wrap up the last piece? Yes, so this, this is the last point. Thank you. Yes, so really the key message is that we really need to build, you know, partnerships and synergies to be able to uh, win this, our war in, uh, in um, maximizing the benefits from aquatic foods. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Richard. And, and you can hear from your introduction, from your contribution, that you are really someone uh, who speaks from experience, able to indicate the several pathways and at the same time indicating where still a lot of work is uh, to be done, for example, in the, uh, the partnerships. So thanks, thanks a lot. Um, very, very interesting as well. So let me move on to our next speaker on the panel, um, Fatia Terki from the World Food Programme. Um, Fatia, of course, I, I know you very well from your former position as Deputy Director for Nutrition in the World Food Programme, but currently um, you are the resident representative of the World Food Programme in Senegal. Um, Fatia, I'm looking forward to you uh, introducing some of the innovative work you are doing on school feeding in, in this country. Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Sinita. Very nice to see you and see so many other colleagues uh, I used to work with. And I would like to say good morning, afternoon, evening to speakers and also the audience today. Thank you for this opportunity to invite me to speak at this important webinar, which is organized also at a special time where we are discussing, there has been the release of the uh, food system guidelines, but also uh, we are heading to the summit on food system in New York. And as you all know, there is so much work at the country level on uh, uh, organizing country dialogue around uh, food system. So really, it is very timely discussion on this important uh, issue around aquatic food and diet diversity and healthy diet. Just to come back to the context of Senegal, just giving you something very concrete on what WFP is doing in terms of uh, implementing its uh, school feeding program and the, the role a little bit of aquatic food. Uh, so WFP's assistance in school canteen currently reaches 235,000 children uh, uh, in 1,262 elementary schools. And we are working in 11 regions out of the 14 in the country. And it represents roughly 15% of the total elementary schools in rural and very urban disadvantaged area in Senegal. And every week, WFP will provide school children with five nutritious meals. There are sometimes, some days we provide breakfast and other days provide uh, lunches that is cooked by volunteering mothers. And WFP is a real key partner to the government, uh, which ambition is to implement a national school feeding program covering 100% of schools by 2025 and having WFP as the implementing agency of this very important presidential program and covering at the end of five years, 7,000 schools in the country. And we are supporting schools through a very interesting delivery uh, modality, which is a uh, cash-based transfer uh, modality, which not only offer more flexibility and the opportunity for schools to diversify uh, the school basket, but also we are contributing into developing the local economy uh, through working with local retailers, smallholder farmers, and uh, women's groups. 
In 2018, uh, uh, WFP Senegal has benefited from 114 metric tons of canned fish donation that has been offered by the government of Japan. That, uh, and we had 57,000 children in 310 schools that benefited from this donation in four regions in the country with a daily ration of 65 grams per child. This equal roughly to 54 uh, kilo calorie per day. So the canned fish was served twice a week uh, on lunches day. And this has allowed WFP to ensure the presence of animal protein in the food basket that is supplied to school uh, canteen. And, and the fish has been complemented by uh, other ingredients, including vegetables and other products that were provided by the parents. So with an added value of animal protein, the canned fish diversified the canteen diet and subsequently enhanced uh, the meal nutrition, nutritional uh, value. Exploring a little bit the use of this locally produced aquatic food in the school feeding program in Senegal. So WFP has supported the implementation of fish found through its resilience program in a number of regions. And the objectives of this project is to create a market for the communities, but also to make available fish providers uh, for school. And this is part of the integrated approach we are promoting in the country, aiming to connecting all the actors we support at the community level. And again, just to repeat, our aim is to not only provide and deliver uh, uh, support to the schools, but also uh, enhance the resilience of the community around. And we are integrating all part of our program that include nutrition, school feeding, and resilience program. And we do provide this support uh, with, with strong support of community. There is a huge community participation in the implementation of our programs. In terms of perspective, uh, we really intend to continue the implementation of our integrated approach uh, with school canteen at the heart of the mechanism. This is our flagship program in Senegal uh, with a resilient community and a strong local economy around schools. And the use of aquatic foods, which is part of that mechanism, will, con will continue to be promoted as well as uh, the food that is rich in animal protein. And again, these are all programs we would like really to uh, improve, to enhance. And again, we are here in Senegal as WFP supporting the efforts of, of the government. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Fatia. Thank you so much. Um, I really uh, listened carefully and I really like the way WFP has been able to already integrate that role of aquatic foods in the several components, in several programs you're working on, specifically school feeding programs and homegrown school feeding programs, as well as the local opportunities that that offers. Um, I am aware we are running slightly behind schedule, so let me turn quickly now to Anita Utaim Iversen from Norway, who is the Senior Advisor on Aquatic Food, sec food, security, um, food security and Nutrition at the Norwegian Ministry of Trade, Industry and Fisheries. Also leading the Global Action Network on Sustainable Foods from the Oceans and Inland Waters for Food Security and Nutrition, which is in fact under the umbrella of the Decade of Action on Nutrition 2016 to 2025. Anita, can you briefly tell us how this report can help link the Nutrition Decade and the Decade on Ocean Science and what recommendations can be taken forward to ensure consumption of and local supply of adequate foods, uh, sorry, aquatic foods, who are also adequate foods, of course. Anita, over to you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to join this panel and congratulations to the UN Nutrition on the launch of this paper. And thank you for bringing the attention to the importance of aquatic food as part of a sustainable, healthy diet. It is very timely with the UN Food System Summit soon coming up. A diet can be put together in several ways and include a variety of foods. 
and aquatic foods are climate friendly and contain important nutrients not commonly found in other foods. If sustainably produced, they are an important key in a sustainable, healthy diet. This paper aims to build consensus on the role of aquatic foods in a sustainable, healthy diet, presenting the better evidence available. And this is a very ambitious task. And we need to remind ourselves of the complexity of this issue. It includes a range of different tasks and topics covered by different professions along the entire food chain, from healthy waters to healthy people, and must, must uh, touch upon all the different elements of food security. A cross-sectorial competence is needed to face our challenges, and cross-sectorial co collaboration is complex, but is important and will help us find the good solutions. We need to acknowledge this. A sustainable, healthy diet must be based on knowledge on the aquatic environment, sustainable harvesting, production and value change, together with knowledge of food safety, nutrition and seafood consumption, health, etc. The Global Action Network is a platform for actors that, uh, with various knowledge to link and learn. And this UN nutrition paper refers to a range of important works and reports where more information can be found. It pinpoints important aspects to be considered and highlights areas that would, should get more special attention in order to take care of the most vulnerable of us. It also looks at the effect of the COVID-19 pandemic on a, the aquatic food chain. We have common challenges. To cope with them, we must gain and share knowledge and share the good solutions. We should bring forward new knowledge and learn from the success stories. But we must also bear in mind the complexity and the variety and acknowledge that actions might need to be tailored to fit the different conditions in the different countries around the world. There are a lot of excellent guidance and re recommendations in the UN system. And these in national policy would make a huge difference. It is great that the UN nutrition put spotlight on the role of aquatic foods. And I'm very pleased to see that this paper also encourages the adoption of the UN Committee on World Food Security's recommendations on sustainable fisheries and aquaculture for food security and nutrition. This is part of the Global Action Network's mission to uh, echo these recommendations. The, the CFS recommendations underscores the importance of aquatic foods and recommends important actions along the entire food chain in order to main, maintain and enhance the contribution of sustainable fisheries and aquaculture to food security and nutrition. It also refers to other important work, such as the Code of Conduct for Responsible Fisheries and the Voluntary Guidelines on Sustainable Small-Scale Fisheries. Science is very, the very foundation of sustainable development. A holistic approach is needed along the aquatic food chain, but everything starts in the aquatic environment. And the decade of action on nutrition and the decade of ocean science overlap in time. The Global Action Network looks for synergies between these decades. And examples of issues important for food future food security is circular economy and exploring the potential of low trophic uh, species such as the mesopelagic. But like the paper concludes, we also need data, for example, to ensure food safety and nutrition. When debating food security, many are talking about volume, but the food available needs to be safe and nutritious too. And we should not only monitor the amount of available biomass, we should also look at the content of nutrients and contaminants. Such data are important to design a food and nutrition policy at the country level. As pinpointed in the paper, access to knowledge, data and technologies is important when developing policies and consumption and for consumption and local supply of aquatic foods. Dietary advice must be tailored based on knowledge on national nutritional status and the types of food that could be available to cover these needs. We highly appreciate that the UN Nutrition are bringing attention to these important issues with this paper in line with the mission of the Global Action Network. It is of great value for achieving our mission and will increase the attention of the, this important uh, food source for food security and nutrition. And we will take this paper with us in the following Global Action Network discussions. Thank you. Back to you, Stineke. Thank you, Anita. Thank you for really very clearly highlighting the synergies between the two decades. Uh, you, you pointed out in your examples, uh, one of your examples, the need to focus more on lower trophic species. And I saw there was one question in the, uh, the questions of the audience. So let's, let's dive a bit deeper there in a minute. And also what I really appreciated was 
that you pointed out the need for very clear dietary advice to include um, aquatic food. So thanks a lot. Now, I have been referring to the um, Q&A, uh, the questions you have been asking uh, throughout the session. There's quite a lot. So I am afraid we will not be able to answer most of them, all of them, but let's try a few at least. So um, I can't say I, I will be able to, to pick the, the most important ones, uh, but just allow me a little bit of freedom of, of uh, grouping a few questions and pointing them to a uh, one or several of our panelists. Um, I see that uh, there's a few questions on the Food System Summit. Um, and how to position this paper in the Food System Summit, also stating that so far the Food System Summit that will take place later this year is, seems to be focused a little bit more on terrestrial food systems as opposed to more aquatic food systems. Um, Shakuntala, would you be able to say a few more words how we will be able to, to link this work with the Food System Summit and possibly also say something about how we will be able to connect this paper, bring this paper to the attention of the action track leaders, of whom you are one, of course. Over to you, Shakuntala. Thank you, Stineke. And um, as you, well, you know, we, we three, you, me and Molly, have already put our heads together and, and, and consulted, for example, with Anita as to how we should do this. And we've already started, as you know, um, um, developing a brief that we can share with the action track leads and, and, and with the influential players within the, within the Food Systems Summit. So I do think we'll work with that and we'll also have to bring in strong partners who can help us to influence the debate, such as World Fish Where I Work, but also the CGIR, which has now accepted that, that moving forward with, with their strategy, we must be looking at food, land, and water systems. And if I will look at the, med, the, the one simple message I have with respect to aquatic foods within the debates I am in, and where I am as one of the leads in, 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 in the action tracks, is that there can be no transformation of food systems if we do not also include foods from water. Because we, we have seen where we are today with the broken food system, it, there's a high re reliability on foods from land. And we must put to use the vast potential of aquatic foods, many of which, as we have heard today, are superfoods, especially for young children and for women. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shakuntala. Um, another um, group of questions, I would say, is, is grouped around the lower trophic species or the small, small, including smaller species of fish. And what is the difference? What are their specific benefits? Uh, Molly, would you be able to, to say a few words about that topic? Yeah, um, yeah, we, we included this recommendation for lower tropic species in the discussion paper for a couple of different reasons. Um, first off, we want to say all aquatic foods are, are nutritious, but um, it, given examples such as small pelagic fish, and I saw a colleague, Kendra, dropped a paper in the, in the chat with some examples of small pelagic species being used for fish powders. Um, these, these small species can be uh, consumed whole, and they can also be made into powders, which have longer shelf life. I saw another question around shelf life in the chat. So, um, yeah, these can be consumed whole. They are more nutrient dense if they're consumed whole with the bones and the eyes um, and the viscera, and, and then they're more affordable as well. And then this also gives the opportunity to reduce food loss and waste. And lastly, shifting consumption towards low trophic species um, can potentially give some relief to higher trophic species that are often overly or intensively fished um, and, and lower trophic species like small pelagics um, reproduce their biomass five times, up to five times per year. So there's a lot of potential. Thanks, thanks uh, Molly. Um, that's very clear and very important for all of us to, to keep in mind. 
Um, I will get back to that possibly in a, in a minute or so. I'd like to turn to Richard for the question about food losses and waste. Or again, there were quite a few questions about food losses and waste. Um, in your presentation, in your contribution, you, you said something about cold change um, uh, uh, in, the, in the fight against food losses and waste. Could you elaborate a little bit more on that aspect, how to reduce food losses and waste? Um, Okay, Th thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, food loss and waste, of course, is one area which is um, uh, quite a big concern. Um, we can uh, reduce uh, not, 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 I mean, not just the losses, but even in terms of reducing pressure from fisheries by acting on what we are able to save uh, from the loss part. Now, the way we approach it uh, in IFAD is um, through investment, uh, uh, first of all, in investing in, in technologies that are sustainable. So increasingly use of solar, uh, um, whereas this could be context specific, but there can be a lot that can be uh, um, achieved by improving the efficiency on how we use solar, for example, for drying the small pelagics. Now then on the cold chain also, you know, the need for investment in terms of cold uh, chain facilities, ice, uh, cooler boxes. Now these make a lot of difference. The small um, 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 bicycles or tricycles that are equipped with uh, cooler boxes makes a lot of difference, especially, you know, for small scale uh, traders. And this is where a lot of women uh, participate. So um, the message here is um, more investment in technologies, also investing in terms of uh, uh, food handling uh, information makes a lot of difference. Uh, and we have seen quite good successes, for example, just uh, by improving, for example, in East Africa, in, in Lake Victoria, by improving uh, the way fish is handled, packaged, is able to move it from uh, the small markets and up to the supermarkets where they get actually much, much higher returns. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Very, very clear. Uh, I would like to ask a question to Kafilwe as well about commercialization. The question is, uh, is basically about uh, that there is serious protein malnutrition among fisher folks. Um, and we hope to include nutrition education as, as part of the intervention improving consumption of aquatic food. Kafilwe, can you say something about commercialization on the one hand and fisher folks suffering from post protein malnutrition on the other hand and what we can do possibly with nutrition education. Thank you so much, uh, Stenek, and thank you for the question posed. I mean, like I mentioned before uh, in my intervention, as AU, we do have uh, strong policies um, regarding to fish and aquaculture. I mentioned the, the 2050 African Union a maritime strategy that also talks about how do we actually promote the consumption of fish and agriculture. And the same thing like you asked, in terms of commercializing of fish, we do have programs that support, for example, the youth in terms of uh, fish processing. For example, we do have seed funding that we support in five countries and the youth in Cameroon, uh, Kenya, Malawi, Rwanda, and uh, Egypt in terms of uh, this uh, investing in, in fish processing as, as the youth. And also, like I mentioned, we are also trying to integrate or promote consumption of aquatic foods through school feeding program, whereby we work with women farmers, uh, empowering them and also strengthening policies around, around fish. As you know, fish is also high risk foods. The element of food safety is also very, very important. So we do have a, a program called Food Safety and Quality Management that we're working in collaboration with the AUC DREA, and we are developing a continental AU food safety strategy that will also tackle issues of uh, handling fish with our fisheries in Africa uh, going forward and prevent um, the uh, fish uh, poisoning, if I, may, if I may put that way. Thank you. Excellent, thanks a lot. I, I would like to give the two more panelists the opportunity for a very brief uh, question, try to be very brief and then I'll try to wrap up. Um, Fatia, for you, uh, maybe also a little bit based on your, your previous experience as being very much involved in the, in the Sun uh, business network. Um, some of the projections for aquatic food production are a bit pessimistic, but there is great initiative for young entrepreneurs in many African countries. Um, 
how can they be supported to achieve the upscaling of aquatic food supply? Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, as you said, we know the, the very important role of the private sector around nutrition and to make uh, our uh, diet healthier. And we are experiencing today uh, the impact of comorbidities uh, and all the damage they are doing in terms, uh, we are looking in terms of obesity, overweight, etc. And as you rightly said, through the Sun Business Network, there is a lot that we can do to sensitize the private sector to produce uh, for healthy diet and to for us to uh, sensitize and inform uh, the, the, the people we are serving on what is good and what is harmful to, to, to their health. So as you said, there is a lot to be done in terms of uh, uh, in, in involving the private sector. I saw very briefly a question about whether WFP in Senegal or WFP in general can uh, introduce dry fish in the food basket. Of course we can, but I think in terms of very briefly for Senegal, our modality is CBT, so we are not distributing, we are not buying anything uh, externally, everything is local, but we have a, a software that is called NutriFam where we are explaining to the mothers and to the parents and to uh, caretakers and every and the community how to prepare the a nutritious food and what are what is nutritious but include fish of course i, I think i'm going to stop here i know thank, we you. Are out of time. Yeah. Thank, thank you thank you patia so um to allow also Anita a very uh, brief question, and then I really uh, like to wrap up. So we, we only run over for a few minutes. Um, you, you're based in Europe. And one of the question refers to, to our Western people to, uh, to eat more mollusks. So not just like the big fishes like tuna, salmon, um, but those those are often too much considered. So the mollusks are often too much considered considered as luxury products. Um, what to do about that? How to make sure that we in Europe also diversifies more our let's say choice in in uh, fish among the fish products that are there available? Well, well, I think it's really really important that we we try to eat more of a variety of the food uh, available. And uh, we should really look into uh, to, to a lot of other species that the, the, the usual uh, ones that we eat. And um, to do that, I think it's really important that we, we look at all the elements of food security because a lot of focus is on volume, uh, but it's also important, as I said, the, the, the safety and the nutritious uh, side of it and uh, what role it has in a nutritious diet. But, but we also have to look at the preferences, which is also an element in food security. And, and to, to, you know, uh, how do we get uh, people to eat a more a variety of food uh, available? And, um, and um, yeah, so I think that's, uh, that's really important that we, we look at all the, uh, the elements in food security and, and, um, and, and see how, how we can have people prefer eating a, a more variety of food uh, available. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. So um, really hugely interesting debates and very interesting and compelling insights from all of you. I'm sorry we were not able to, to um, answer all your questions in the, in the chat box and in the Q&A box, uh, but please continue asking them. Please continue reaching uh, out to us. But for now, let me try to wrap up and, and try to give you three uh, takeaway messages that at least, you know, tend to stick to my, uh, my mind. Um, first of all, again, the, the diversity, the huge and rich diversity aquatic foods offer us. It's so much more than just the fish, the, the few species of fish that you may see in, in the shop you, you, you frequent. Aquatic foods is, is um, yes, it is fish, but it's also other animals. It's aquatic plants, it's microorganisms. And we need to recognize that huge diversity in our diets. So let's tune, fine tune our dietary guidelines to that rich diversity. Second, um, we face huge environmental problems and issues. 
But when we recognize the diversity and we, there is no need to overfish or overproduce that one single thing or animal or plant, we can really make use of a very sustainable way of that rich diversity. Of course, this needs to be governed well and controlled well, but we can do that. There is the option. All the speakers have highlighted it throughout. And lastly, again, highlighted throughout uh, this afternoon, morning, evening, um, by several of the speakers, we are in the run-up to the Food Systems Summit. And this, will, this summit will present game-changing solutions to transform the food systems we are currently having into more sustainable, healthier, and more equal food systems. And as we heard today from all of you, aquatic foods should be part of that solution. So that's my three takeaways. I'm sure you have your own takeaways, but now, I just want to, to thank again all my speakers. First of, first of all, of course, Shakuntala and Molly, who have been uh, investing so much time in this, in this paper to, together with me, but also together with many, many other people. So we are proud and very happy that finally we've been able to, uh, to present the paper to you all online. And please download it. In a, in a couple of weeks, we will make available some printed copies uh, as well. Then also a big thank you to my colleagues, Holly and Ale, who uh, are in the UN Nutrition Secretariat to, for really working behind the scenes and making this possible. Also together with the, the colleagues in uh, World Fish, Matt and, uh, and Anish. And thank you lastly, but not last but not least, all the speakers who have made their time available today and uh, have been um, with us throughout and answered your, your question. The recording and presentation slides, they will be made available on the UN Nutrition landing page, should you wish to refer to them later on. So thank you again. Have a lovely rest of your day, evening, afternoon, morning, and I hope to see you soon online or even better in person. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.